Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this second event from Bright Blue's new event series, Looking Ahead to COP26, presented in partnership with the John Ellerman Foundation. Uh, my name is Andrew Limming, and I'm an energy and environment researcher with Bright Blue. Uh, this event will be focused on green habits, namely how we can nudge consumers, including ourselves, towards sustainable lifestyles compatible with climate change goals such as net zero. In recent years, awareness of the importance of consumer behavior as a driver of climate change has increased. More and more attention is being paid to the environmental impacts of the food we eat, the transport we use, how we heat our homes, and innumerable other aspects of our lives. A recent poll conducted by Nielsen found that 73% of global consumers said they would change their consumption habits to reduce their impact on the environment. But achieving this on the scale required for addressing climate change is proving difficult in practice. So the key questions we'll address today are, how can consumers be made more aware of the environmental impact of goods and services, as well as their carbon impact? How can social norms around carbon intensive consumption be changed? Should a minimum sustainability standard be placed on consumer products to stop the sale of products which greatly exploit the natural environment? And how can consumer participation in carbon offsetting schemes be increased? Here to discuss these questions with us today are Anthony Brown, Conservative MP for South Cambridgeshire and currently the chair of the All Party Parliamentary Environment Group, Louise Davies, Chief Executive of the Vegan Society, and Professor David Halpern, currently the Chief Executive of the Behavioral Insights Team. Uh, before we begin, I just want to remind the audience that if you'd like to submit questions for the Q&A session, you can do so using the Slido event link located below the video or on Twitter using the hashtag bright blue. Uh, the speakers will have five minutes to discuss their ideas regarding green habits and nudging, and then we'll open it up to audience questions afterward. Um, Anthony, would you like to start? Okay, well, thank you, Andrew, for that introduction, and uh, thank you to Bright Blue for hosting this uh, important event ahead of the very important COP26 summit in November, which a lot of government activity is obviously focused towards. Uh, obviously, have already legislated for a fifty percent uh, for for uh, uh, to get net zero by twenty fifty. Uh, the government have just announced to uh, raise the target to 78% reduction by 2035 en route to that. Uh, and a lot of the work the government is doing, a lot of things that we look at at the all-party uh, all party parliamentary group on the environment are about the policies needed to deliver on that target. Um, the, the issue that, you're, that this event about, about nudge and beha behavioural uh, economics, uh, is very important, but I want to give just one caveat uh, right at the beginning, which it isn't enough uh, to get to net zero by itself uh, at all. I think over the overwhelming majority of uh, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions will become will come from uh, regulation and uh, taxation and the government creating the right green infrastructure and creating the right uh, incentives for companies to invest in uh, green improvements and so on. Uh, it, you won't get there by the goodwill of people and changing habits on its own. But having said that, nudge and changing habits and people doing what they want to do to help the environment is a very important thing and absolutely the government should do what it can to try and encourage movements in that direction uh, and to try and maximise that contribution to uh, net zero. So I think it's very good you're looking at these issues. Um, I think the first thing is uh, is obviously just general awareness and that's that's happening anyway. Uh, we've got far more awareness of uh, uh, the importance of tackling climate change now than we had even five years ago or ten years ago. Uh, and and maybe you could do more educating in uh, in schools. And I know that's an issue amongst uh, certain environment groups. But the, the next thing is actually enabling people to make the decisions that they want to make to help the environment. And for that, you have to have information. Uh, people have to know what is the right choice uh, to make. So uh, we obviously already give some information on the en energy efficiency of electronic machines, whether it's like washing machines or dishwashers or televisions. Uh, and that is... Uh, that is very good, and if people are environmentally minded, they can then choose uh, those uh, more efficient things. But it's, that is quite limited. There are lots of other products and goods where you could indicate the uh, energy efficiency or the, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions attributed to that uh, good. For example, uh, we don't say the air miles on food. 
uh, and it will say that the green beans are made in Ken uh, grown in Kenya, for example, then you could do your own sums. But it'd be good, uh, or I'd certainly be very interested to see some more systematic labeling about the energy consumption used in a product. So those people who do uh, care about these issues can make the right uh, decision. Um, the second uh, thing that I think is important is having really robust alternatives so that people people can make uh, have confidence in making choices if they want to so for example one thing that's been very is been quite a big growing movement is uh, carbon offsetting and this is the idea that if you buy a plane ticket for example you can then go and buy some carbon offsetting and uh, try and make it a net zero flight uh, the I mean I, I'm absolutely all supportive of the principle behind that uh, the as a sort of path of getting net zero aviation uh, but the trouble is that these offsetting sch schemes a lot of them really aren't robust at all and in fact although they might make people feel better about flying or whatever they don't actually do that much to reduce uh, carbon emissions so I think there's a real uh, role for government there uh, or regulators to make sure that these offsetting schemes uh, are absolutely robust and do what they say on the tin so that if people want to uh, use them then they can do so with confidence because if you undermine trust in them then people will just stop uh, using them um, mm -hmm. and the other thing and this May, may go beyond uh, sort of pure nudge, but it's just making sure people have the right uh, incentives to do the right thing. And um, this verges into sort of taxation and other areas, but um, uh, struck by solar power, for example, that the people, people used to be able to make money from putting up uh, solar panels and selling electricity to the grid. Those effectively as a subsidy for putting up uh, solar panels. Uh, and a lot of people invest in solar panels as a result of that, those subsidies were reduced. And I think a lot of people stopped putting up uh, solar panels. So that's not necessarily nudge as it were, but it's a sort of, uh, it's uh, creating, making it easier, less costly for people to do things that they uh, would otherwise want to do. Um, in terms of actual policies, uh, there's, uh, I think there's quite a few uh, things. I know I'm sure Dave, David Halpern is a, a world expert on these things, will uh, be able to give uh, far greater insight than me. But one thing that's uh, had a lot of interest is on and it is comparing people to their neighbours where they live in terms of things like energy consumption, for example, uh, or uh, pick, you can have pictures of people's houses and the heat that comes off it, off their roofs versus their neighbours. And if you show people a picture of a street full of uh, energy efficient houses and that their house is bright red, uh, throwing off heat, and it can be have got a big impact on their behaviour because they're comparing uh, being compared to their neighbours. A more uh, systematic way of doing that is actually just uh, telling people what the average energy consumption is for houses in their street, for example, and that they're 30, if they're 30% above the average for their street, then people do compare themselves to their neighbours, and that's going likely to be able to uh, to incentivize them to go and uh, put in more energy insulation or turn off the lights or uh, whatever. Um, the... Uh, uh, Another thing is on food consumption. I'm very struck about the, the, the and I suspect Louise Davis might talk about some of this, but the, the, um, the amount of food that's wasted because of best, uh, uh, best before dates, uh, which we know are far too uh, strict and food that is often uh, totally uh, fine is thrown away. You could, have a, you could change the system to an, an often good until system, uh, date system, which would encourage people to uh, use the food until it's actually... Uh, 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 still uh, until it actually goes off. Um, so I think there are lots of different measures like that that could be put in place. Uh, the main, the most important thing is that the government uh, uh, does actually think about these sort of issues and, and gears policies towards looking uh, at these nudge aspects of it. And obviously uh, the government previously uh, did think about these things quite a bit. I think it's uh, less less common now, but I would certainly urge the government to treat it more uh, more more seriously because uh, a lot of human uh, or people's behavior has or attitudes have changed dramatically towards climate change and far more people are keener to do the right sort of thing but don't necessarily know what to do so in summary we need more information we need robust credible systems uh, and we need the right incentives for people and that will make a difference but it's not the total solution to climate change at all we do need a lot more uh, robust government action in terms of regulation and uh, taxation and so on excellent thank you for that um i would just ask a quick follow-up anthony if you don't mind do you support measures such as a carbon uh, border tax for instance to shape the types of uh, prices and products that are available on the market 
um, and more directly reflect, you know, the impact that these products yeah. have on clients. Absolutely. So I, my, my sort of background is more sort of classical uh, economics. And I, the, the um, climate change has been described rightly, I think, as the biggest market failure of all time. But actually, people use this very cheap, uh, comparatively cheap fossil fuels, and uh, they don't have to pay the price of the impact it has on the climate that affects the entire planet and humankind and nature. Uh, so it's massively artificially cheap. And so whenever people burn fossil fuels or use energy, uh, they're actually uh, paying, even when it's got duty on it, uh, they're getting it far cheaper than they should do because the impact it has on the climate. And ultimately, the solution to all this, and you can do it through regulations, artificially, whatever, but ultimately the solution is to get uh, the, the economy, people, businesses, uh, to pay the right price for carbon and to actually price it properly. And that would make it far more uh, expensive. And that would create far more incentives to use low carbon forms of energy, such as solar power, which would therefore, therefore be uh, a lot cheaper. And the uh, and once, if you then align all the, the if you price in the externalities of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, then that would solve an awful lot of the problem of uh, climate change. So yes, that means having uh, carbon tax, uh, you know, we are bringing it in in the UK. We've got some of it by proxy, but like fuel duty, but actually there needs to be, it needs to be done on an industry level. We've had the emissions trading scheme of the EU, which set a price on carbon as well, but we don't really have proper carbon markets uh, in the UK and proper carbon pricing. If we do have that, if we do get that, then your question was about carbon border adjustment payments. Uh, and this is, for those who don't know, this is the idea that it, uh, it makes no sense if we, for example, make uh, the steel industry pay the price of producing steel in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions and we make it so expensive that actually nobody buys British made steel, but they buy steel uh, from other countries where they don't uh, have that cost of steel. Uh, that actually all you're doing is exporting uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, and it actually massively disincentivizes any country from really taking the action needed. Uh, and again, from a pure economic point of view, it makes absolute sense to have some sort of carbon border adjustment payments like that to make sure that no country can undermine international efforts to reduce climate change by having artificially cheap uh, energy uh, used to make uh, industrial products and gain a competitive advantage that way. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Louise, I'll turn it over to you for five minutes if you'd like to uh, take the floor. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting me to take part in the event. Um, I'm really pleased to be part of this discussion um, for various reasons, but there are a couple that I just wanted to touch on. Um, it's really good to be talking about the how and not the why. Um, I'm often asked to make the case for why veganism supports sustainable lifestyles rather than how we encourage that move. Um, but just in case anyone is in doubt about the place of veganism in sustainable diets, um, this is a well-studied topic and the evidence is absolutely clear that vegan diets are much more environmentally friendly on average than diets containing animal products. The most comprehensive piece of research available on this was from Oxford in 2018, but its results have been replicated in multiple major studies. And the study concluded that moving from current diets to a diet that excludes animal products would reduce food land use by a massive 76%, cut its greenhouse gas emissions by 49% and reduce its freshwater use by around 19%. So it's evidence like this that has led WWF, the Intergovernmental Pan Panel on Climate Change, the UK Committee on Climate Change and the UN to call for a significant reduction in the consumption of animal products. And then the second reason I'm pleased to have been invited um, and obviously to talk about veganism and food is because it's such a tough issue. I think there are a few behavioural shifts more um, towards more sustainable lifestyles that generate more resistance, particularly when it comes to leadership on the issue. And of course, asking consumers to shift to renewable energy is a relatively minor inconvenience compared to asking them to reconsider what goes on their plate three times a day when they might have been following similar eating patterns for decades or even generations. At the Vegan Society, we engage people in dietary change through the health, environment and ethical routes. Um, obviously, today is about the environment, so I'll be mostly talking about that. But I wanted to note that food systems are highly complex and a multi-criteria approach is important. I think what we need above all else is action from government and business to achieve the necessary scale of change. Um, as Anthony said on Tuesday, we heard the welcome news that the government is aiming to cut carbon emissions by 78% by 2035 compared to 1990 levels. And that story was trailed in the media with the expectation that the government would be adopting the Committee on Climate Change's recommendations which include a reduction in meat and dairy consumption. But then in their press release later in the day, the government said that they'll be looking to meet this reduction target through investing and capitalizing on new green technologies and innovation, 
whilst maintaining people's freedom of choice, including on their diet. So the government's um, carbon budget is based on its own analysis and doesn't follow the Climate Change Committee specific policy recommendations. And I do understand this reluctance to interfere in what people eat, but I and much of the scientific community believe it to be essential in order to meet our targets. And we simply can't rely on technologies which are yet to be proven. So I've got a few thoughts I'd like to share on how consumers can be encouraged towards more sustainable lifestyles with measures that don't restrict people's freedom of choice, but bring down the barriers that currently discourage people from choosing healthy, ethical and climate friendly diets. More leadership, by example, is vital. So all the reports that we're seeing saying move towards plant based need to be backed up by those sponsoring organisations taking decisive action. So things like plant-based by default catering are all of their events. So when you ask for special dietary needs, that should be about meat and dairy. So this would include the World Health Organization and UN bodies, including COP26, where I believe meat will be on the menu this November. Government could mandate that all public institutions offer a plant-based option on every menu. So this would include hospitals and schools. And schools are particularly important to encourage children to understand that meals don't need to be meat and two veg. And embedding that idea at a young age would be really important. The government could be running an awareness campaign stressing the importance diet has on climate change and health whilst promoting the benefits of a plant-based diet. The Vegan Society run a campaign called Plate Up for the Planet, which could form the basis of that sort of campaign. WWF released some data this week that showed that people in the UK are keen to be green. And their data found that from 2019 to 2020, there was an average 17% reduction in individuals' overall carbon footprint, as well as a 25% increase in people adopting plant-based diets. But the average carbon footprint will need to reduce much further than that to help the UK meet its climate goals. So if we accept that people are keen to be green, perhaps the government consider, could consider creating a toolkit for the public with actions to tackle the climate emergency, which might include the importance of the switch to a plant-based diet. We could encourage access to plant-based foods by supporting new plant business, plant-based businesses to set up. Startups and entrepreneurs could be supported through rate relief measures. And finally, we need to ensure that people can afford climate-friendly food. So this could be via subsidizing plant-based food production, taxing more damaging foods, or even just legislating for a real living wage to ensure that people are supported to make the choices that they want to. So those are just a few ideas about how we might move towards more sustainable lifestyles, particularly sustainable diets. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation today. Excellent. Thank you for that, Louise. Um, I would just remind the audience that you can submit questions through the uh, Slido link below the video if you're, you're interested. Um, and uh, David, I will turn the floor over to you. Five minutes. Thanks, wonderful to be here. Um, what an important topic. Um, we're, of course, working and supporting Asian government and others on um, COP26. Um, they, um, where to begin? Um, Anthony would be very pleased. Actually, I, I agree quite strongly <laughs> that nudges alone certainly aren't going to do it. Um, and indeed, um, the original authors of Nudge, Cass Sunstein and Rich Taylor, just finishing off their updated um, edition after Goodness, it's 12 years since original nudge came out. And they have a, a, an updated chapter on climate change. And for most of it, so you know, they're, they're very into, um, you know, essentially uh, choice enhancing, so on and so on. They don't like to use the centers most of the time. But when you come to climate change, it's pretty obvious. That's going to have to be a big part of the story. Um, so I think we, we're aware of that. Um, indeed, uh, psychologists and behavioral scientists often said, of all the various issues which we wrestle with, climate change is the most difficult one psychologically because it's, like we're, we're just not wired to handle it. It's distant gains versus future, you know, versus immediate gains, diffusion of responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. So one concern is, is when, even in Louise's number one, the public, I think, genuinely do want to do something about it, but then their actual behavior lags quite a long way behind it. It's like, why well, are going to change eating that, you know? So there's two, kind of two main things I just say. One is, so how can it help, um, given that clearly a lot of it is behavioral, um, we have to put other measures in place. Um, we tend to go, by the way, beyond nudge because we're interested in behavior change, which includes the use of well-constructed incentives, right? So that's on the table for us and anything else. But there's at least kind of three areas. One is um, direct action. So there are clearly some things and being clear in our messages to the public about what you can do. We had an interesting and um, kind of just robust discussion with the producers of Blue Planet about why did you conclude on plastic? 
I mean, great to do stuff on plastic, but is that really the most important thing that most people in Britain could do? You know, you go into your hipster bar in Islington, no, no thanks for the straw, but I'll have a double burger. You know, it's like, what is the more important thing to do? So to get people clear about that, are there things meat being an obvious example? Um, the second major issue is adoption challenge. So um, even when you do have technology, it doesn't mean anybody will use it. A current important one has been EVs, electric vehicles, but other forms of technology, how do you encourage uptake? Um, and, you know, classically, you say 80% of products fail on last mile problems because the public don't like them, don't understand them, or don't fit in some way. Um, and then in the end, of course, go absolutely deeper, just build the whole thing around human beings. And maybe just to say, including well-designed regulation to make it possible. So I just thought I'd very quickly skim through. We sometimes use this very simple mnemonic that you can use, and both as an individual, but also as a regulator or government. Um, EAST, you want to affect behavior, you think easy, attractive, social, timely. And it's actually not a bad one for climate change. So how do you make it easy? You know, what would you do? Um, Louise gave a very good, simple example, which is change the default. Why isn't the default, um, you know, opt in for meat as opposed to opt in for vegetarian? That's a very simple default. We know defaults are unbelievably powerful. The same is true around energy tariffs and so on. Another one, Anthony probably knows more about even than me. We think one of the major things is to make it easier for people to express through their pensions um, a, a decision about, can you green my pension, basically? You try doing that. It is really, really difficult. It's even difficult to assemble how much is in your pension if you've got more than one. Um, and so can we make it easy? Because that would be an amazing thing to do. We can ask you one thing to do. You know, Andrew, when you go home tonight, can you just click this button and green your pension? If only, right? Make it easy. Attractive. Um, yes, some of this stuff can be silly, but, um, you know, we ran a, an experiment. Louise probably knows it. Um, where we asked people to, you know, would you have a vegetarian breakfast and not very high take up. But if we called it field grown, would you like a field grown breakfast? Twice as many people would choose it. Now that might not seem very high and mighty, but that makes quite a big difference. And it makes a particularly big difference if it makes a difference between a restaurant having it on the, on the menu at all or not, because enough people are buying it. Um, so things like that, um, you know, uh, or another issue would be identity. You know, when when you do make a change, can we reinforce it? So if you, if an individual, you know, says, so as we've seen on plastic bags, stop using plastic bags, um, are you doing that because you're mean and you don't want to spend 10p? Or are you doing it because it would thank you for wanting to save the planet? Here's some other things to do. So you want to help to attract, you know, almost shape it, how it gets interpreted. Social, what are we doing? What are everybody else doing? I mean, the example got some pickup is we said electric vehicles, they should have blue number plates. And the reason why I want to do that is because when Anthony gets his super duper new Tesla, he's probably already got one. Um, and the, the, the world should see that it's an electric vehicle because social proof is an incredibly powerful force, particularly to move uh, equilibrium. And then the final thing, which has a particular edge to it right now, is we're very interested in timely moments. A lot of, as, as um, everybody's already said, a lot of behavior, certainly around climate change, is habit based, right? You do the same thing tomorrow that you did yesterday and so on and so on. It's so behavioral scientists are really interested in things that disrupt your habits, anything that changes your habits. So a classic example is we want examples to get people on bikes and you want to work out what's the key disruption. Well, if you've got a new bike station, will people adopt it or not? An absolutely key thing is send people a prompt when they've just moved house, right? then you can get really quite significant uplifting because they're not, you know, the behavior has been disrupted and so on. So, uh, and the same is true in, in lots of other areas. So um, really important. The last, last thing I would just say, um, it is really important. So for those who know about the behavioral insights team, you'll know we're super geeky and we run experiments all the time. And um, why that matters is because a lot of things that seem like they're good ideas don't necessarily work. And I can actually, Anthony's inadvertently given me a great example. So it's absolutely true. Giving people feedback, about how much energy they use relative to their efficient neighbors drops energy use by about two, 3%. It's great, easy win or whatever. However, we also did test this idea about if we send people a picture of their home in infrared and you could see how much energy they were leaking out, based on actually a study done by, by Portsmouth, would it make people more likely to take insulation? And in fact, it didn't work. It actually backfired, if I remember correctly. Um, it may be you see this glowing home and you just think, well, that looks warm and snuggly. I mean, who knows? Or people are distracted by the image. But one of the points about behavioral science is 
we need to marry this kind of effort to save the planet with actually really testing all the details of these things and figure out what works better. And you start adding them up. And actually, I feel quite confident. We could, we could do this thing. So there we go. Let's do it. Excellent. Thank you for that, David. That's, uh, that's really fascinating. Um, I would just, I'd just like to ask, uh, you know, kind of building on a question from the audience, actually. Um, so, uh, let's see here, I just had it. Um, well, it's disappeared now, but someone asked about a, uh, a meat tax, for instance. Now, I would imagine that this would neither be uh, easy for many people to accept nor attractive and be the sort of thing that would be likely to backfire when it comes to encouraging consumers to adapt and change their lifestyle. Um, and it also seems like many of the changes we're going to need to address the climate crisis are neither easy nor attractive. So how do we approach these, these issues which, you know, the consumer must be brought around to accept over time without setting ourselves back in terms of progressing on climate change. I mean, you asked me that question just to check, Andrew. I'm opening <laughs> that up to the floor. You're, You're inviting me to, to cause a, a, a good storming headline. Um, look, um, clearly financial incentives, including tax, can make a big difference, but they particularly make a big difference when you've got a clear substitution. So we're really interested in saying, what is the substitute behavior? Um, a very good recent example, of course, is the sugar levy in drinks, which you may know we worked on a lot. It's been an extraordinary success story, um, but it works particularly because there's an alternative substitute which manufacturers and others can use. So we're now running, I think we're past 40% reduction in sugar in British drinks. I mean, that's amazing. And the market for drinks has increased. So manufacturers are actually selling more. So you especially want to use um, a, a tax or an incentive like that when you've also got a clear substitute. So you can kind of do the math, do you or do you not, you know, but they clearly can have a significant role to play. Um, and particularly if they tilt a market equilibrium, which, which drives manufacturers to do more. So again, on sugar, um, a minority of the work is done because Anthony just says no to the diet, you know, the coat, he goes to the diet, uh, him personally. It's being done by the reformulation and the stocking decisions, right? So it changes the market equilibrium. Could I just come, oh, sorry. No, absolutely, go ahead, Louise. And then yeah, just... I just wanted to agree that I do think, you know, financial, financial interventions are really important, but the metrics need to be really carefully considered. And, you know, if you look at a meat tax that is purely driven by carbon, then we have a situation where you could be quite easily moving people away from red meat towards intensively farmed chicken or fish, which I don't think the public want. Um, and of course, that's not something that we, the vegan society would be wanting. So I think Dave is absolutely right in that you want to be trying to shift diets towards what is right across various metrics, not just carbon. Um, and I believe one of those should be about ethics as well. But you know, I think we want to be shifting diets to the foods that we believe we should be eating. So I think there potentially is a place for a tax, but um, I haven't seen a model which ticks all the boxes as yet. But if I may follow up on that, building on a point that David made that I think is really important, as someone who has been a vegetarian, pescatarian for the past decade, right? I, I know that there often are not adequate substitutes for meat consumption in many circumstances and I'm sure for many households, right? So how, Louise, do you propose to kind of address this question of, you know, nascent markets within vegan and vegetarian, you know, sort of lifestyles, uh, allowing for a substitution to, to drive a consumer shift in that direction? Well, nutritionally, there are plenty of adequate alternatives and we work with the British Dietetic Association to spread the message that you can be absolutely healthy, cover all your nutritional needs on a whole foods um, vegan diet. Um, so, you know, this is taking away any of the kind of meat substitutes or processed alternatives. If you're looking at moving to a diet that, you know, uses um, pulses and beans instead of meat, then, you know, you would be covering um, what you need. Um, but yeah, of course, there's a huge swathe of new plant-based products on the market. So in terms of taste or attractiveness and ease that we talked about, um, those 
um, new businesses need to be supported and they need to be affordable. So if you look at, for example, the price of a pint of dairy milk compared to the average price of a plant-based milk, the plant milk could be more expensive because plant milk production isn't subsidized in the same way. So there are things that we could be doing to level that out and make those products more accessible and affordable. Anthony, would you like Sorry. to then here? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not going to create headlines by coming out in favor of meat tax. Um, the, I, and I, 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 mean, I fully agree with the point that, that uh, David made that actually the, these sort of, uh, incentives and taxes like that work far more effectively if you've got uh, a substitute that people are really happy with. And the, the uh, sugary drinks is the perfect example of that because you can't really taste much difference between uh, Coca-Cola with sugar and, and uh, Coke Zero. And so it's so easy for people to substitute and it works incredibly well with plastic bags because actually it's very easy to get into the habit of not using disposable uh, plastic bags. Um, but if you have something like meat where uh, I know there are nutritional substitutes, as Louis says, you know, you can get your uh, all, all the vitamins and proteins and everything you need elsewhere. But actually, a lot of people feel from a satisfaction point of view that it's not quite the same having a, a, you know, a corn burger than a, a beef burger. Uh, there aren't really, the, the, one of the issues is there aren't really substitutes there at the moment. And what, one of the things that did want to say is, is uh, and I've got a company in my constituency doing this, uh, cultured meat. And I've no idea where the vegan society stands on this, but uh, we had in, in uh, December last year in uh, restaurants in Singapore, we had the first commercial sale of cultured meat, it was chicken nuggets. So this is actual chicken muscle cells that are grown in a, uh, effectively a laboratory or in a commercial environment. So no no chicken was killed, it's slaughter-free meat. Uh, and. Uh, if it take if that can it is early days in the technology but if it does take off and if it is commercially viable in terms of building up economies of scale it is far more environmentally friendly than than uh, growing animals uh, there's absolutely no doubt about that as well as the sort of animal welfare issues uh, there would then be a clear substitute so you could either have a, a, a beef burger made out of slaughtered cow or beef burger made out of cultured meat uh, and I think then it'd be very very easy for uh, people to uh, make that substitute and the government to uh, you know if it wanted to nudge people from one to one to another uh, would do that but I think actually if that cut if that does happen and it, I, there are about 30 companies in the world that are developing this cultured me um then uh, uh if, if it does become commercially available i think there'll be a, the, the culture change that we're already clearly seeing in terms of the growth of vegetarianism and veganism and there is clearly a culture change happening there uh i think it would accelerate massively if there is a uh, an alternative that people can't where people can't really taste the difference between the different types of meats and i think actually eating i can also see an environment where eating animals that were uh meat that were from slaughtered animals would somehow become uh you know almost taboo in a way but that is that is quite a long way off. But I wouldn't, in the meantime, a, a meat tax. I, I think you, you, if you did something like that, I think you risk having a massive backlash uh, against uh, you know against the government and against that sort of that that uh, whole agenda. And I think you'd need to do it in other ways. And if you are taxing bads, uh, as it were, like, like carbon, I think it's far better generally to do it at the wholesale level. So we've got a a plastics tax that is coming in that's been legislated for uh, and that's to encourage recycling rather than directly aimed at uh, uh, climate change but that that is done at the at the wholesale level at the manufacturing level so that and this comes to the point that David made that so to encourage manufacturers to reconfigure their uh, formulations and to make sure they use recyclable plastic rather than and recycled plastic rather than unrecycled and unrecyclable plastic so it changes the way that business operates rather than the attacks at the retail end where suddenly consumers are paying more because they bought a product that's not made uh, from recyclable plastic rather than rather than recycled plastic. And doing those sort of taxes at the wholesale level uh, are often, uh, it can be a lot more unacceptable amongst voters, but also a lot more uh, effective. Whereas the sugar tax, as, uh, as David pointed out, and that was, you know, it's a tax at the, re um, it affects consumer behavior because it just adjusts prices at the margin, but actually, often also the main chain, the main impact was the reformulation that happened. Uh, yeah, so this this touches on an interesting topic, right? So it's like, we have a couple of questions from the audience here uh, that are asking about kind of the, the ethical lines around nudging and consumer behavior when it comes to climate change. So um, an anonymous question, anonymous, viewer has submitted a question asking, how do we ensure that nudging people towards sustainable lifestyles doesn't turn into shaming people, right? And then another question, uh, 
when does nudging become manipulation? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, I mean, David will give a, a far more <laughs> thought through an academic answer to this. Uh, I, I, absolutely, you, you've, you've got to be careful. And basically, I'm, I'd be basically opposed to things that are coercive where people don't have uh, alternatives. And that you've, you've got to, in a democracy, you've got to bring people along with you. And I think that's, I mean, I, you know, I certainly support the, uh, the objectives and aims of groups like uh, Extinction Rebellion. But I think where they do go wrong is they don't, they're trying to be far too coercive on the general population. Uh, if they got their way, they'd, uh, on a lot of issues, they'd end up with a massive uh, backlash. You'd end up with movements like the Gilets Jaunes. And I, I I'm not, uh, I'm not ready to give up on democracy uh, just yet. So you, you absolutely need to be aware of these, um, uh, the, these sort of considerations about whether it's manipulation and, and so on. But um, you know. You just, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, just have to use common sense about that. I mean, there are lots of things. I mean, David mentioned the power of opting in and opting out. And we have opt-in, uh, opt-out uh, uh, pension contributions so that uh, that uh, uh, the, the uh, auto enrolment on pensions. Uh, is that being manipulative? I mean, I know some, I, I've certainly found it slightly irksome in the past that I've had to opt out of something I didn't want to do uh, in the first place for various reasons. And, uh, uh, but, you know, by and large, for most people, it's not that bothersome. Is it manipulative? Well, you can call it that if you like, but actually, it, you know, it is, will lead to better consumer, better outcomes for most people in the long run. What's your take on this, David? Um, yeah, well, obviously, the question which we wrestle with always. Um, I think there are three quick lines of defense. Number one is to say, for, for first of all, there's no neutral choice architecture. The classic example is the canteen. Do you come to the, the, the chips before the salad? Which way around? Like it's gonna be one way or the other. We know that by the way, most people fill up their plates with the first three things they come to. So, you know, what should it be? Um, and in an environment where often there are also behavioral predators, and in fact, Anthony may have in mind, you know, there are a lot of commercial players who add in what someone's called sludge. They add in friction to make it more difficult. Like you try and cancel a subscription. Like, for God's sake, can we do something about that? Like, take away the bad. So that's the first line. The second one, which is particularly from North America, it tends to be, Anthony again actually rehearsed it, which is where possible, let's try and make um, policy which is choice enhancing or not choice restricting. So that's normally some form of default as opposed to enforcement. So these same issues apply for regulation, actually. But, you know, we were, uh, a good example, we were big on um, electronic cigarettes as a substitution, and we wanted them to be widely available in 2011, as opposed to regulated out of existence. That would be choice enhancing and also save a lot of lives, I think. I, I personally think it's still not enough. So, because I think it's always a legitimate question. I've written about this, like in Inside the Nudge Unit and elsewhere, but you should say, who is nudging the nudges? So people like Anthony should be, not people like me. And this... But beyond that, a lot of these issues, particularly where they concern lifestyle, the real expert is the public. So I've always been a big believer in the use of deliberative forum. So I think if you go back to the simple example of the canteen, well, who should decide? Well, not me, but you could get a group of parents or whatever in the particular case and say, this is the evidence, this is the effects, so what do you think? Which comes first, guys? Um, and try and create um, a mechanism where the public can decide. And that's particularly well suited for something like climate change, where you're locked into a kind of an equilibrium. You know, should we have more cycle lanes or should we not? That's gonna you know, be irritating to some people. Um, well, can we collect to lose side? And the advantage of doing that is that um, it's also not just a signal to governments to make changes, it's a signal to each other as citizens. We've had a big think about this and we decided, you know what, Louise is right, we're gonna go with changing the default so that it's you opt into a meat as opposed to opt into vegetarian, right? But you sort of have to collectively decide it and it creates licensing. So I'm a big believer in those. I'd love to see more of them. Hey, I'd love to have a third chamber in the House of Parliament, which would be a rolling deliberative forum, but that's where I'm at. Yeah, this is a, the question of democracy, I think is, is interesting here. Um, so we have a question from Roger Evans, uh, and I'd like to direct this to you, Anthony, if I may, right? How can the national government provide more support for local councils when it comes to making electorally tough decisions about energy provision and car use? Um, I know Roger Evans, who is a local councillor. I'm not sure whether it's the same one. Um, the, 
Yeah, I mean, the government, so electric vehicle use, uh, one, one of the big challenges for it, there's, there's multiple challenges. One is that the upfront cost of electric vehicles at the moment is higher than a, a, a petrol or diesel vehicles, uh, even though the running cost is lower, but it makes it more expensive for a lot of people to buy into it. But the other one, relevant to your question, is uh, getting charging points and uh, making having them distributed across the country so that people can charge their cars quickly and particularly high speed charging points. Uh, and that involves local authorities. So things, planning decisions like in, ensuring their charging points in, in, um, uh, in new built houses, for example, putting charging points in car parks, outside supermarkets and so on. Uh, there's actually a big role for local authorities within their area to help, uh, to help that roll out. Um, I think installing charging points is it's mainly I mean there are some complicated technical complications but uh, like whether you can use the wires that already exist for lampposts etc but uh, largely it's a cost thing uh, and uh, local authorities like national government at the moment are strapped for cash but certainly it sounds like the point of Rogers Evans's question is uh, that uh, governments the government can provide more uh you know could in principle provide more funding to subsidize the rolling out of um of charging points uh, in terms of making tougher decisions i mean things like uh local authorities have uh, obviously made a lot of money some of them from uh, parking and introducing parking controls and uh, uh giving uh, having cheaper parking for zero emission vehicles and you've got the same with congestion charging in london and i to be honest that Given the local authorities make money out of uh, uh, effectively creating a taxation, if that's the right thing, on um, on fossil fuel cars, uh, on, and certainly on high emission cars, I'm not sure they really. I can't see they really need support from the government uh, to do that because they're doing that already quite effectively. Yeah, David, you have your hand up, and then I'd like to go to Louise to ask a question about the vegan aspect. Well, I just wanted to come in. I think. EVs are really interesting. It's fascinating how they're coming up um, and so fast. Um, by the way, I think it's a good area where, um, and we've increased engaged with DFT about this, is that a lot of people are worried about an EV um, and you want to have their first test drive. And when you, you drive one, it's like, oh my God, it's like a normal car with cooler pictures on it, whatever. Um, and so, you know, using the DVLA infrastructure. So Andrew, when you're, um, you know, 20 year old, whatever it comes up and you're going to have to pay tax. Why, why wouldn't DVLA in advance say to you, you know, you're going to pay this big tax. Um, but in particular, to connect to the local is click here and choose which test drive you want to have from your local dealer of your EV. The other one I thought we would thought would be a really neat thing for local governments to do is because again, it's got its equilibrium dynamic a little bit about other enough charging points. Is it's a good, be it's a good um, possible use case for a collective purchase where you say, you know, if 500 people in this area sign up, boy, we'll be able to negotiate a really good deal for some electric vehicles. And if this many people sign up for their next car, you know, we will also commit to putting in X many more charging points at the same time. So you could use a kind of collective purchase mechanism, which a local authority could actually facilitate, which would get a better deal and would help you sort of leapfrog to the next level. Anyway, I'm not aware of one having done that, but I think it would be a, it's really worth someone having to think about. Louise, on the question of veganism, I was going to ask if uh, you knew of any examples sort of at the local level with local councils and local governments that are taking initiatives around uh, action on vegetarianism, veganism, providing substitutes, incentives, et cetera, and uh, kind of connected with that. What do you think of the role of, uh, you know, campaigns to stop eating meat altogether? Um, yeah, I'm aware of various local councils that have declared a climate emergency and then are looking at uh, food within their action plans to address that. Um, and I mentioned in my opening um, message that one thing that's quite easy for councils to implement would be to introduce a plant-based option as standard across their council public sector um, institutions and I think that has been done in uh, Leeds so that you know it's there's always a plant-based option of standard so if you're in hospital or you're in school you don't have to make a special case for it it will be offered in the same way as the um, food with animal products will be in it so that that's a pretty straightforward thing that people can do which will build up familiarity with those foods um, and ensure that people just start to understand that meals don't have to include animal products in them and obviously there's a climate win there too, because if more people are eating those foods, then you know, you're 
hopefully um, reducing your greenhouse gas emissions. So that's something that I am aware that some councils are doing or considering doing. Um, and then, sorry, your other question was about campaigns that are just cut out meat completely. Yes, uh, someone asked this in regard to the uh, the recent documentary on Netflix, Sea Spiracy. Um, well, obviously, I'm talking on behalf of the vegan society who want to see an end to all animal exploitation. So we do want to see a world where there is no animal products in our lives at all, you know, into so, you know, fashion, cosmetics, food. So, you know, we we try and use positive messages to get people on their vegan journey and to encourage them to start cutting out animal products. So um, I think, you know, we talked a bit around um, shaming and messaging. And of course, we always try, try and do that in a really positive way, talking about the benefits, which are for the environment, as we're talking about today, but for individual health. And obviously, there's a, a huge ethical driver there, too. Um, I think there are different approaches to getting that message across and some organisations which take a more um, explicit way of getting that communication out there, which isn't a, an approach we take. You know, we avoid any sort of slaughterhouse imagery or anything like that. Um, it's very much about the positives. Um, rather than, I suppose, kind of scaring people into a different uh, way of life. But I, I think there is space for all sorts of different messaging to try and encourage people um, to make that choice. So Matthew asks, um, we know what unsustainable lifestyles are, but do we really know what fully sustainable, sustainable lifestyles look like for everyone on the planet? So if you think more broadly beyond the UK, where obviously the initiative to cut emissions, reach net zero, et cetera, has resulted in a significant transformation of the dialogue and the policy measures, right, uh, that we're using to drive uh, the, the renewable transition. But if we zoom out and we look at the rest of the world, how do we think about nudging on a global level and changing consumption patterns beyond our own borders. David, do you wanna maybe take that one on first and then we'll go around? Um, I'm happy to, that's a pretty big ask. Um, of course, COP is a part of that story precisely. Uh, BIT actually itself is something that was in British government and now is a social purpose company and partly because we can then work in other places. Of course, we tend to get asked to go to places which are relatively affluent nations, um, but, but still, I mean, some of the financial stuff is really important on the investments, like the pension side, because that isn't actually in one country only. Um, and it starts to create potentially quite rapidly global drivers will shift it. Um, are there differences, by the way, cross-nationally? I mean, like, partly the, the argument is how can it be done and you know, the technical aspects, which are really, really important. There are also psychology differences. I mean, people talk about shaming. In the West, we, think, we generally think shaming is a bad thing. Actually, but a weird psychology is full of guilt. We feel guilt's okay because guilt's about my own internal reference standard, whereas shaming is someone else making me feel bad. So there are actual differences in psychology about how you constitute this in different places. Um, but you know, can it be done absolutely link up? I mean, the world's pretty damn joined up. If you want to not just climate change is antimicrobial resistance, if you're pouring antibiotics um, into your food supply system in in India, it's gonna give you issues with AMR elsewhere. So we are gonna to have to figure it out globally and a pretty good place is, I think, to get out and start lots of places, but our finance system working and our, and actually Anthony was talking about the externalities at the beginning, but classical economics matters here too. So that the costs are in fact appropriately being um, buried, born where they're falling, not just um, having this massive public good, which we're all, you know, burning through. So shall I come in? So uh, obviously it's a global problem. I mean, we all share the same uh, same atmosphere. It's got the same amount of carbon dioxide everywhere. Everywhere, uh, it, it's in the nature of it that uh, more affluent countries and more scientifically advanced countries will be in a, in a better position to use some of their science and their affluence to cut their carbon dioxide emissions or the, and their greenhouse gas emissions. And certainly, uh, you know, the UK now we're we're actually we've almost halved our uh, emissions since uh, 1990, and partly largely through uh, moving to renewable energy in electricity production and phasing out coal and 
uh, uh, increasing solar power and in particular wind power. Now, the, w what needs to happen and will happen almost by osmosis, but actually it should be an objective of government policy, uh, is this science and the, these new technologies uh, need to be transferred to developing countries and it needs to be done with an economies of scale uh, that actually they uh, it's more efficient for them to uh, pick up. So places like Africa are ideal for solar power in terms of having lots of sunshine. Uh, and so the cost of solar power has uh, fallen really dramatically in the last 10 years and uh, for a whole load of different reasons, but largely uh, partly because of uh, economies of scale. And there will be become a time when actually it'll be far cheaper for African countries to uh, to install solar panels to generate electricity than it would be to build a traditional power station like a, a coal power station or so on and that you might find uh, leapfrogging of technologies but I, it's absolutely given it is a global problem uh, it isn't just a problem for uh, you know one country or some countries uh, I think it should absolutely be an objective of government policy for and sort of UK government policy uh, to help other countries, developing nations, to acquire these new technologies uh, in a way that is, uh, you know, economically feasible for them to do that. And certainly, you know, part of our uh, aid program and uh, uh, relationships with uh, uh, with other countries is doing that. And, and part of that is coming out through uh, COP26. Uh, there's, you know, parts of the programs there are uh, to help developing countries develop. Uh, become greener uh, in themselves. And one thing's on the finance side, I agree, one thing we didn't mention earlier, and this is a bit, uh, discussion's been sort of focused on consumers, but there is a really big thing on the climate rate related financial disclosures, which are being, being mandated uh, in the UK. But this is part of the, Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, is advising uh, COP26 as the financial advisor there. And one of the things he's trying to do is get these climate related financial disclosures uh, mandatory around the world. Uh, and this is where companies have to re basically report their exposure to and, and the risks they have in related in relation to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So the investors like pension funds that David is talking about uh, can know whether what a company they're investing in, whether it's got uh, climate risk or not. Uh, and that will, re but this is comes back to the point I was saying in the beginning about having more information that this allows investors and individuals through pension funds to assess, uh, you know, how green or, uh, uh, you know how sustainable different types of invest investments are, but that is a global thing, and because a lot of these markets do operate globally, and uh, and it would make it have wouldn't be much point if you only had one co one country doing it and no other countries doing it. Uh, but and hopefully, as I say, the UK has already mandate said it will mandate this, and uh, other countries. Uh, hopefully will mandate it as well. And then global financial markets will have a whole sort of filtering system in them where they, which pushes towards uh, net zero, as opposed to at the moment, they're neutral on the issue of net zero. Louise, is there a vegan society take on, on say like free trade deals and other things involving obviously, you know, um, exchanges, preferential treatment around agricultural products, meat, et cetera? Um, well, I, I think all I would really say is that, you know, globally, the food, food system is, you know, is broken. We've got populations with an obesity crisis and we've got populations who are hugely nutritionally inadequate. So, you know, clearly you can't have a one size fits all solution to, to address that. Um, I think, you know, you see a lot of countries where vegetarianism and veganism is their you know, natural cultural, cultural um, food. But then in, in China, for example, there's been a huge increase in meat consumption. Um, which now they are taking measures to reduce. Um, I think what we can do in the UK is lead by example and share knowledge and education um, with other countries about how you do shift towards sustainable, healthy plant-based diets and you know, how you can look at research and development in terms of what you can grow where and what's the most you know, sustainable produce for, for different areas. Well, uh, I think we're reaching the end of the session, but uh, given that our event series is looking ahead to COP, I would uh, just like to go around and maybe ask each speaker to give um, their ideas for what COP26 should do in terms of addressing some of the, the challenges that we've, uh, we've discussed here and maybe what that giant green global nudge would look like uh, coming out of the uh, the COP conference. David, would you like to start? I'm sure we did very well by getting through this, we're not talking about COVID. Obviously one of the background features of this is the world has 
had the mother of all disruptions that no one would have chosen. But behaviorally, that also gives you a moment to try and do something differently. At both individual level, you see changes around what people are, how are eating and living, but also in other ways too. Um, top of my list would be, you identify the things, particularly the public, which are the small number of asks, you make it as easy as possible for them to do that and make their choices. Um, and the ones which particularly move in equilibrium, right? So when your behavior has knock-on consequences beyond it. So that's why something like being able to green your pension would be a phenomenally powerful thing if we get people to do that, we had the mechanics to do it. So it's those classes of interventions that have got the biggest promise, um, you know, if we can make it easy for citizens to do things which they kind of want to do anyway, it seems. Well, the key, key to success to COP is obviously to get all the countries to have really robust, uh, nationally determined commitments and uh, providing pathways to them to reduce their carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the, one, the one thing uh, that you mentioned earlier that I'd really like to see come out of COP is the border carbon adjustment payments. Uh, and that really is something you need to do at an international level. Obviously, it doesn't really make any sense doing it. Uh, it doesn't make much sense that individual countries doing it. Uh, you need agreement between the sort of major countries. And... It's necessary, coming back to incentives and the issues of nudge you uh, talked about, because otherwise dirty countries would have an incentive to undermine the, the attempts of cleaner countries to go green. And you need call, uh, carbon border adjustment payments to stop dirty countries undermining countries that are trying to do their bit for net zero. Oops. Um, well, unsurprisingly, I'd just like to see governments, uh, particularly the UK government, stepping up and including dietary change in, as part of the path to achieve our NDCs. I, I think that's crucial. Um, I don't think that we're going to hit our climate goals unless that elephant in the room is acknowledged that, you know, we do need to look at what we eat. Um, and there are plenty of soft measures to try and encourage that. Um, and then lastly, I'd just really like to see a plant-based menu at COP. Um, I think that's really important. Let's lead by example and get meat off the menu there. Alec, of course, I think it's vegetarian. I don't think he's a vegan, but right? he's become the president. I mean, Alec, so that's at least one start, a good one. Excellent. Well, uh, David, Louise, Anthony, thank you so much for the uh, valuable contributions. Um, I, we really appreciate it. Thank you to the audience for the uh, wonderful questions. Um, this is the second event in Bright Blue's Looking Ahead to COP series. Uh, we will have another event coming shortly, which you can find on our Twitter page or our website. Um, and we hope you'll join us for that. This has been Looking Ahead to COP, presented in uh, collaboration with the John Ellerman Foundation. And uh, until next time, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.